How's everybody doing? I got some good news for you. You know what it is? How many days of school, how many days of classes do you have left before this semester's over? Does anybody know? Anybody know? Good news. After today, you have 18. We looked up last night. Yeah, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. We looked it up last night on the academic calendar, and you have 18 days, and then your finals, and then the semester will be over. So good news. I have been looking forward to this um, for a long time. I actually spoke to John Davis back in September. I'm taking the year off from teaching. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but... The reason why this invitation was so exciting for me is because any time I am asked to speak, immediately I know it's a time I'm going to hear from God because over the months of praying and thinking about this day, He has been pouring into my heart what He has for you today. And I appreciate so much um, the prayer earlier that you won't hear my words because God, I believe, has something very special for you today. So I'm going to pray very quickly, and we're going to get into what God has showed me. And if you don't mind, I would ask you to silence your cell phones, put those things on airplane mode or turn them off, and I want you to get ready to hear from the Lord because he's going to tell us something special today. So let me pray. Jesus, um, this time is all about you. You are more important than any text, any email, anything we could hear today would not match what you have for us. So I pray that you would quiet our hearts, that you would make our minds and our spirits alert to the Holy Spirit. And after we leave this place, we will be changed, all of us. Why? Because you have showed up. So I trust you, Lord, take over. You're amazing. You're the best. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, it's been a crazy year in the Raider Ball House. Barkley and I have been through a lot this past year. We've lost two parents. My dad passed in December, and, da and Barkley's dad actually passed last week. We've had some crazy sickness and crazy things go on, but in the middle of that, and that's really where this message is aiming today, is because I want to talk to you about God's faithfulness in the storm. And I want to talk to you about safety that can only be found in Him. When Dad was staying with us three weeks in December, he was actually at MUSC going back and forth for chemotherapy. And those were really, really long days at our house. He was very, very sick, and we knew with stage 4 liver cancer, he probably was not going to make it. And by the end of those days, we were exhausted at night laying on the couch, literally laying on the couch saying, God, thank you for getting us through another day. Well, this is kind of funny because one night, my dad, we had moved our bed from upstairs, downstairs, to where my dad could sleep in our little den. And one night, while laying on the couch exhausted, the phone rings about 10 o'clock. And there's a little guy. He sounds like he's in a really crowded room, and he's on the other line saying, Hello, miss. Hello, miss. I have to tell you that your computer is being hacked at this very moment. He said, You might want to go to your PC right now. I have the serial number on your PC because any moment... Your phones and everything you have on your computer is going to be destroyed. Do you hear me, miss? And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. He, I said, what's the number? And so this dude, you know, I'm like listening. I think he's really smart. I think he's from maybe India. I think I maybe, you know, might be getting in trouble here. So I'm like, he's drawing me into this story. And he said, I have, the, I have the number for your PC. Go and look. I have it. So I get on the back of my PC, and sure enough, he reads out the number seven, five, six, four. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's real. I'm being hacked. And so within just a matter of moments, this little guy has me at my PC, and I'm like, oh, gosh, and he's showing me screens. He has actually pulled up screens on my PC. He says, see, ma'am, at any moment, your computer's going to crash, and all your information's going to be gone, and they're going to take all your money. He said, I have to go remote with you. So, yep, blonde, I let him go remote with me. Yep, we're there together. And I'm like, where? Show me, show me. And 
Thank goodness we didn't have our banking information on there because about an hour into this conversation, I start thinking, I think this might be a hacker. And sure enough, my dad, bless his heart, he's laid up on the bed. He's going, get off the phone. It's not safe. Get off the phone. (laughs) And I'm like, Daddy, I got it. Anyway, long story short, I got out of that situation without him getting information because about three-fourths the way through, I said, this guy is not good. So I hung up the phone and got out of that situation. But turn a corner with me and think about this. Where in life are you safe? Where are you safe? Are you safe in your house at 10 o'clock at night when the doors are shut? Are you safe in relationships? Are you safe in your car? Where are you safe? And I start thinking about this question because I can tell you, according to Cloud and Townsend, if you've ever read any of their books, if you don't feel safe, you will never grow. In relationships, in life, in your career, safety is a foundation for all of us because it's God's imprint on our heart. We desire above most things to feel safe. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, this is a bar of gold for you psychology teachers. Lots of information written in textbooks. Freud, you name it, have so many ideas about what the human psyche is like. But you know what? God told us what it was like in the Bible. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and this verse has ministered to me over the years more than I can begin to tell you. Because you see, I'm a biology major. And things in life have to connect for me. A has to equal, has to B, has to equal B, has to equal C. That's the way my mind works. And several years ago, when God began to work in my life, I said, God, you have to tell me exactly what has happened now that I have trusted you for my safety. And that verse in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you, in other words, set you apart, through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. And the one who has called you is faithful, and he will do it. Go with me here. In that verse, what God is telling us is that we're a trichotomy. You and I are walking around on planet Earth in three parts that never stop working together. We have a body. That's the flesh, the bones, the joints. Everything about your structural frame, God says, this is your earth suit. And this is where I'm going to live when you trust me. We also have a soul, according to that verse. Now, if you look that word up in the Greek, it comes from the word suche, which means soul. And that's actually where we get our word psychology. Your soul is your personality. God gave it to you. And praise God, everyone has a different one. We have introverts. We have extroverts. And you are the way you are because God made you that way. And there's zero mistakes in that. Your soul. And here was the eye-opening part for me. The spirit, the unholy spirit that we're born with is absolutely the core of who man is. And you notice the color of the cup signifying sin. And guys, FYI, this is where every worldview parts. Every worldview out there parts at this point. Because it's only Christianity that says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful and wicked. Who can understand it? It's beyond cure. We are born broken. We are born enemies of God. That sounds harsh, but scripturally it's true. 
We are born naturally opposed to him. Because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, we are born with sin. And we are in a mess from the beginning. Trichotomy. You see, every worldview out there says, you can clean this cup up. You can pray five times a day. You can recite the Shahada. You can give 2.5 to alms. You can fast during Ramadan. And you can go to Mecca once a year if you want to get this right. Every worldview out there, every one of them besides Christianity says, you can make this better. And that's where we differ. The good news of the gospel is, is Jesus says you can't clean it up. There's nothing you can do to make it right. There's no prayer you can do that's good enough. There's no, there's no Christian service because it's the state you're born in that's the problem. You're unsafe. And Jesus said, that's why I have come. And that's what his conversation was about with Nicodemus. In John chapter 4, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he was very learned in the law. And he said, tell me, Rabbi, what must I do to be born again? Do I enter into my mother's body a second time? And Jesus says, no. He says, no. He says, you must be born of the Spirit, Nicodemus. He said, you got, we, we've got to have a, an exchange factor going on. In other words, Nicodemus, when I get into the equation, the unholy spirit is eradicated, my Holy Spirit comes in, and this is the new creation. When you begin to search that word up from 2 Corinthians 5.17, a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. When you dig into those words, it says a creation that has never existed before. Brand new. And that's what it means to be born again. When you get Jesus, you get God, you get everything. You have the same Holy Spirit that Billy Graham has. And this is what takes you the distance. This is ultimate safety. Because when you do not have the Holy Spirit of God, you're not even in the race. You're not in, even in the race. There's a chapter in Revelation that says, stop walking around as though you were alive when you're really dead. And guys, this can really, in all honesty, this can be tricky. This can be tricky. Jesus is very clear in Scripture. If you don't have the Holy Spirit living on the side of you, you are dead. This is the ultimate safety. Now, I would ask you, from Jesus forward, when you have the Holy Spirit, you're eternally secure. You have him guiding you. You have him leading you. You have him fellowshipping with you on a daily basis. What are you going to do in life storms. And I so appreciate it. We didn't even coordinate the music. And that last song they sang, Christ alone, cornerstone, in the storm. We didn't, we didn't even coordinate that. God did that. But I'm asking you, when, when you have the Holy Spirit of God and life's storms come, and believe me, in 2016, we've had a lot of them in our household. Two deaths major sickness, what are we going to do in the storm? I can tell you that your response is going to depend a lot on what you think about God. And most of us equate that with people in our lives who we've grown up with. If you had a mother and father that loved you unconditionally and who modeled Jesus for you on a daily basis, my guess is that your picture of God is going to be pretty solid. Sometimes maybe not. But you know what? I taught school for 28 years, and I can tell you, even in Somerville, South Carolina, in the Bible Belt, there are kids in the past two to three years that have said, Miss Redable, what is a Bible? What is a youth group? 
more and more in the world we live in, Jesus is not heard of by a lot of people. You'd be shocked. So how are you going to respond in trials when, when, you, when you get into really, really intense storms if you don't know the heart of the Father? If your background was unsettled and you didn't have a home, which most of us didn't, honestly, where love was flowing and love was good and we saw Jesus in action, it's going to be hard for you. It's been extremely difficult my entire life to know what the heart of God is like. I guess that's why I'm so crazy about nature. Because in nature, when I begin to look around at his artwork, I'm convinced he is who he says he is. If you don't have a background where you're like, I saw nobody, nobody showed me what God's love was like, how in the world can I trust him? You have nature. Romans 1 says that even nature cries out that God is who he says he is. I've got four up on the screen I just want to tell you briefly about today. Saturn, the pileated woodpecker, the giraffe, and Brian Head Welch. Saturn, just take a look at it. It's called the jewel of the solar system. It's a gas giant. It's 763 times the size of Earth. It's a ball of gas. The yellow you see there is ammonia. If you put that thing in a bathtub, it'll float 93 times the surface area of Earth, and it suspends in space at God's command. The first time I saw this guy at USC at the planetarium, tears rolled down my face, not because of the planet, but because God, only you could make that thing revolve. The pileated woodpecker, Study this guy. Google it. Get on your phone. Look up details of every animal you'll see. You'll see God in the center of it all. He made it. The pileated woodpecker. Guys, that thing has sponge in its feathers. It's got the hardest skull of any known animal. It's got a shock absorber between its brain and its beak. Its tongue can stick out 10 inches beyond its beak to go into the tree to pull out the insect. It's got glue and barbs on its tongue that it glues, attaches to the insect, rolls back in, swallows the bug, and the glue dissolves. This guy is studied by brain surgeons. This guy is studied by flight recorder boxes. People want to know how that skull and brain were made, and I'm telling you, only God, Jehovah God can do it. The giraffe, what the heck? That thing's neck, what on earth? I'm telling you, I almost passed out coming up the steps. What, you drinking water and you raise up? I'm telling you, he's gonna pass out because of blood pressure, what? He has two times the blood pressure in his system than any other animal. Why? Because God made him with a long neck. And he's got this thing at the base of his brain called the wonder net that stops and it controls the flow of blood because he's so tall. He also has flaps running down his throat and running down his windpipe that cause things to go one way. I'm telling you, he's a miracle. Evolution can't create this. I'm a biology major. I've heard about evolution my whole life, and the longer I live, the longer I know it's a slap in the face to God. God made that guy. But if you can't see it in animals and you can't see it in nature, please just listen to him. So in my head, I was like, okay, I'm going to accept Christ in front of everybody right now. Then I'm gonna go home and snort drugs until I don't wanna do them anymore. And then I ran out in Europe, had my drug dealer just crazy. send me drugs through, through the mail. And I'd be tweaked out in my hotel room watching this package come from the US. It's just <laughs> nuts. My life just was like spinning out of control. And Janae had come out on, a, on one of the tours in the US. I just remember me. her skipping around the house She's singing one of our corn songs called Adidas. All day I dream and I'm like going, what am I doing? I'm a junkie. My daughter's singing all day I dream about sex. And uh, I'm going to die.
father. My uh, real estate broker, Eric, he, uh, he said, Brian, I don't mean to be weird with you. I, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I, f I felt the scripture like jump out at me. I've never done this before, you know, so I don't really know how to do this, but I felt like this would mean something to you. It's Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Father, I felt so much fatherly love from, from heaven, and it was like, I don't condemn you. I love you, I love you. It was just love, love, and instantly, that love from God came into me. It was so powerful that the next day I threw away all my drugs and uh, I quit corn. I was like, I'm quitting corn and I'm gonna raise my kid. Brian Head Welch, former lead singer of corn, transformed in a moment by God's power. If you can't believe that testimony, and I've looked him up and I've researched him lately, and he is still walking with God. He actually looks like totally different. His eyes were so dark in that picture, and now he really honestly looks like Jesus. You should, you should Google him. He's, he's, he's like got these light in his eyes. I'm like, oh, my goodness, he looks like Jesus. But he is back with corn singing some songs, and his band is actually transformed as well, um, if we can trust media. That's what's out on the Internet. But that is a radical transformation, and that's actually what happens in all of our lives. So I ask you, if you are going to trust God in the storm, what do you think about him? What do you know about him? What do you know to be true about him? Can you trust him? Can you lean on his heart? One of the most interesting examples in Scripture, because when, when I ask myself that question and I say, God, how can I trust you in the darkest storm? I've actually done a lot of research for this talk in the story of Noah. And I don't think there's any time on earth, any time when it's been darker than that storm hit when water co covered the globe. And what you find in that scripture is that as God was preparing, because that scripture says the following, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on earth and had become, and that every inclination of the heart's thoughts of the heart was evil all the time. And the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. But what you find when you study Noah is that his hand was getting ready to destroy the earth, but his heart was preparing safety. And when you read about every detail of that ark and the three levels that were created, 450 by 75 by 45, 18 inches of air at the top, food for every kind of animal. When you read about that, you see the tenderness of God in the middle of life storms. And I ask you to consider, just for a moment as we look at this clip, think about what this would have been like. When you're safe in Christ, you're safe in the storm. Scripture tells us that one of the darkest man or one of the darkest moments on the globe, man, God opened that door. Man inside, and the Lord shut him in. Can you imagine? 
Noah, sons, wives, and his wife were on that ark. He entered on his 600th birthday. He got off when he was 601. They were in, in that ark for more than a year, and God met their every need. You see, where you see God's hand, you can trust his heart. And not only is he orchestrating from start to finish every single detail of the storm, he is in the storm with you. His presence is with you. And you can trust him. What we see is God not only managing the details of the storm, but we're seeing him manage the details of them coming out of the storm. Noah was able to send a raven, and if you didn't know it, ravens are birds of prey. They're scavengers. I never thought about that until I studied for this, this talk. Ravens, the reason I think he sent a raven out was because it was a bird of prey. It was going to go out to find the carcasses. It never came back. And then a few days later, he sent out a dove, and the dove returned, and he sent it out again, and the dove came back with, a, with an olive branch, and by this time they realized that that ark was settling down on ground, and in just a few days they were going to get off. God was managing that from start to finish. So I ask you, and let's look at these scriptures together. I also want you to look at the rainbow. That's amazing. Never take those for granted because that rainbow is a sign in the sky of God's grief that happened while they were in the storm. But it's also a sign of his promise and his faithfulness to deliver you out of it. And I just thought about this the other day. You know, you can't see the colors of light unless they're bent. There's seven colors in white light. And you can't see it unless it's bent. And in that rainbow, we happen to see that the seven colors that are there in white light. And God is saying also, there's way more in your circumstance. There's way more behind that closed door than meets the eye. You can trust me. You can trust me. So I want us to read these scriptures together. And I want to make a point to you that I hope you will never forget when you enter the storm. Read with me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am now convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you guys to read the next one. Go ahead. Do you get the picture, CSU? Safe in Christ, locked behind some of those most amazing circumstances you could ever be in, and Scripture says at every arrow, in every direction, you are safe. Why? Why would you ever walk away from this gift why why would I ever walk around without this gift spiritual safety because he is with me spiritual safety because he enters the storm when I'm locked behind doors and spiritual safety because he's guarding me in all directions I want you to meditate on the words of this song and then we're going to close in just a minute but I want you to think about the words to this song and think about your storms. 
Think about your spiritual safety and think about the tender heart of God while you're in it. I didn't know if I would share this part with you, and you guys can play, um, but I'm going to. This year has been the hardest year of my life, the hardest. I've been behind that locked door with no light of day on some days. Last year, I suffered a mold exposure in the classroom I taught in. And my immune system went crazy. Allergic to every kind of food. I've never hardly taken a Tylenol, but all of a sudden I became allergic to almost everything I put in my mouth. I had to strip off all dyes. I couldn't wear dye. I couldn't wear makeup. Lots of toxins in makeup. I found a better brand now. But the real kicker was when I became sensitive to electromagnetic signals. And I went to my doctor and she said, yeah, this is really bad. I had to put down my cell phone. I had to stop watching TV. And it was really, really dark. Because that eliminated me from people. And there were a lot of days 
that I would just walk in my yard because I was so sick. But the one who manages storms was in my yard. And I will never exchange, ever, the moments I've had with him behind that door for all of the healthy days in the world. Because what he showed me in those moments, and I'm getting better now. Praise God, otherwise I wouldn't be on the stage. I'm getting better, and it's taken me a year. But I can tell you that he is there. He is there in your darkest hour. He is there. He is managing it from start to finish. And you can trust him. But if I did not know him, I would have been lost, desperate, and out of hope behind that door. He was there with me. And he'll be there with you. If you don't have the white cup, you're not in the race. You're out in the water drowning. This is the ticket to the ark. What on earth? Why on earth? It didn't cost you anything. But it cost him everything. And I'm asking you, why would you ever walk away from that? I'm going to pray right now. And if you know for a fact that he's not the center of your life, you're not in the race. And when your arc moment comes, I don't know what you're going to do. This is safety. And there's nothing his power can't reach. Jesus, where can we go apart from your spirit? Where can we hide from your face? I beg you now to search this room. There are people in the balcony. There may be people watching on different parts of campus, but God, you know and you see every heart. And you know who is safe, and you know who's not safe. And I pray that you would prick their hearts right now at this very moment. And that you would call them home to safety. The ark moment's coming. It's coming. It's just around the corner. Who knows what it's going to be? It may be finances. It may be a car wreck. It might be sickness. It could be the loss of a loved one. Who knows? But God, it's, the storm's coming. And you say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So God, for those who aren't safe, please prick their heart now and cause them, Lord Jesus, to come to safety. Amen.